Hello, hello, and welcome to a brand new 2021 episode of Red Clay This Month. If you're like me, I'm just grateful to have that year behind us. Yes, we shall not speak its name. But seriously, I'm so excited for a new start on so many levels, and this show is just one of them. As difficult as it was last year for, for folks, there are still some amazing accomplishments and achievements from our students, our teachers, and administration. And today we'll look at some of those incredible educators who won Teacher of the Year and Employee of the Year in the respective schools. And we get to talk to Red Clay's Teacher of the Year, who just happens to be the state's Teacher of the Year as well. How great of an accomplishment is that? So let's zoom on in, shall we? First up, please welcome to the show our Education Support Person of the Year, AI DuPont High School's Miss Kathy Ellis. So welcome, Kathy. Hi, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. So the first thing I'd like to discuss with you, Kathy, is your pathway to becoming an educator. Well, um, I've always been interested in helping children grow and develop. And I started in early childhood education, uh, working in daycare. Uh, but when I came to Red Clay, I realized how much I enjoyed working with school-age students. And I've been here ever since. So, um, and I think one of the things um, that has kept me here is the sense of pride that uh, we, our district, we have in our district. And, um, you know, I realize nothing's perfect, but I, I believe that Red Clay has always um, tried to stay ahead of the curve in educating students. And through that, it's created a sense of pride within myself and, um, so here I am, 21 years later. Excellent. So we're going to go just a little bit off script for a moment because you just made me think. So tell me a little bit about your role as a paraeducator. And I know you think you're just doing your job, but what sets you apart uh, that resulted in your recognition as paraprofessional of the year? So tell us again what you do as a paraprofessional and don't be humble. What sets you apart uh, because you obviously do it very well? Well, I, um, I think that my years of experience have helped a lot. And personally, uh, my husband and I have a blended family of seven children. So I've seen a lot of different personalities in, in children, which has helped build an understanding for myself. But um, I, I just think that being flexible, being willing to be a team player, um, and being willing to take that step beyond um, when the opportunity arises helps to set a person apart. So what does your day-to-day -day look like? What do you do as a paraprofessional? Well, um, currently I work with uh, high school students. I'm at AI High School and I am a one-on-one. -on -one. So I, I primarily um, am assigned to support one particular student, but you know, it just goes way beyond that. And this is where the flexibility comes in. I, when I go into a classroom, uh, I believe that we should be a team and work together to support each other, to provide the best education possible um, as a team, not just focus on um, one student. And I think that it also helps holistically because the children see me as someone who is there for all of them, you know, um, not just pinpointing one child. Um, but currently I'm one-on-one. -on -one. There's different roles that I've played over the years. So, um, you know, I've been in a classroom para where I've primarily worked, you know, with one teacher um, in different roles. So, but currently I am, I'm a one-on-one -on -one at AI High School. And I'm sure, as you indicated, you've built relationships with many students. So what are some of the top tools or strategies that you've used uh, during this hybrid model for connecting with students to build those relationships and, and to connect with each and every student? Yeah, so the, the, you know, the hybrid really has um, you know, made it hard to uh, educate. It's an adjustment. It's new. It's something that we have to adjust to. Um, but I think the important thing is, um, well, number one, patience. Uh, you know, everybody, you, you don't know what somebody's going through. And with the virtual learning, you have internet connection problems, you have family things going on, 
Um, and then other outside things that our children don't have any control over. And I think that we need to understand that um, patience is a big part of that. I think we also need to um, be real. And that's whether you're face to face or whether you're online, kids know when you're not and they respond to that um, and make the connection. Use a lot of positive feedback, not just emails and phone calls with, you know, what Johnny did wrong, but, you know, talk about what Johnny did right. And um, I think that that really helps a child feel connected to their education, their school, their building, their teachers, that sort of thing. If you had to pinpoint and say what you love most about being in the schools and the role, what would you say? Uh, well, you know, um, I think the thing that uh, stands out to me the most with what I enjoy is just watching the children grow and develop. You know, they're all individuals, the way that they behave the way that they talk, the way they interact, the things that they say, you know, the creativity and how they um, present information or even some of the questions they ask, things you would never think about. You know, it's almost refreshing sometimes. But um, I mostly watching them grow and develop, working in high school for most of my years, um, they come in in ninth grade as very immature, you know, young students. And then four years later, they're seniors and they're young adults. And, you know, um, I can look at that sometimes and kind of feel pride that I had something to do, even how, you know, no matter how small it was in helping them become the, you know, the young adults that they're you know, becoming so. You say it's something small, but to the students, it's probably something tremendous. You know, I had the same opportunity. I had the privilege of working in a middle school and then following those same students into high school. So I watched them grow from seventh graders to 12th graders and the transformation was just amazing. And it really, it really sticks to your heart. So if you had to pick your top three things, uh, the three things about your students, and you've already shared some of them, what are the top three things that bring you joy about working with your students? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would say that they, they keep you young, you know, um, the individuality, because it's just, um, you just learn so much from them, their creativity, Things that, especially when I was younger, you know, times has changed so much, but the creativity is just such a joy to see. Um, and, and then um, watching them develop into uh, young adults. I mean, that's, they're really the three things that stand out the most to me. That's fabulous. And um, how might your students describe you? Give me three ways that they might, in fact, describe you. That's a, that's a hard question for me. You know, um, the thing that stands out to me the most um, in feedback that I've gotten from students um, was that nice lady, you know, it's like you're there, um, you know, uh, she's there all the time, but we're not really sure, you know, what it is she's doing, you know, um, which really is the goal of it because, you know, you want to be subtle, but you, you know, because you don't want to overstep your teacher but um, you want to provide assistance without them feeling like um, you're hovering over them or that sort of thing. So I really, um, that's about as far as I could go with that question. Sorry. I think that's a great way to be described, that nice lady. And that nice lady who probably knows more than any adult in the whole building uh, of what's happening in all the classrooms because you get to see it all. You probably have more knowledge than even the principal has. My last question for you, uh, because you give of yourself every single day. Every single day you're giving to teachers, you're giving to students, you're giving to your school, your family. How do you make sure that you take care of yourself so that you don't run out of energy? Yeah, um, interesting to have to reflect on that. Um, and I know that the district and our building, our school, like the head, you know, headspace and have been very supportive um, to try to, to help us to provide self-care. Uh, for me, I, um, I listen to a lot of inspirational music and I like to swim. 
So I go to the Y and I swim. And uh, I think laughing is important. It is so important to find humor in things. I try to watch, you know, co comedy movies, funny videos, or just laughing with my friends about jokes and, you know, things that we can find humor in, I think is really helpful. I love that. I don't know how to swim so well. I, I can actually keep my head above water, but I do love humor. I love a good laugh. I love to make people laugh. Humor to me is a one of my top ways of staying happy and staying positive. Well, Kathy, it has been my pleasure spending time with you today. Congratulations on being the Red Clay District Paraprofessional of the Year. Truly, truly, I can see why you deserve this honor. Uh, so thank you for what you do every day and for joining us today and spending some time with us. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. So stay tuned because when we return, we'll be visiting with more amazing teachers of the year. Sorry about that. No, no, I've been staying at my dad's place because of everything. Oh my God. He's good. Yeah, I know, we keep missing each other. Uh, I've been working out of my dad's house doing some reading. I should be working out more. I just feel like I'm drowning. Navigating these times can be tough, but while you care for your loved one, you also need to care for yourself. Go to aarp.org caregiving for free mental health and self-help tips. Welcome back. On this episode, we're speaking with some of our Red Clay Teachers of the Year. And up next, we're fortunate to have with us Miss Ebony Myatt, a third grade teacher, Teacher of the Year from Warner Elementary School. So Ebony, tell us a little bit about yourself and your road to becoming an educator. Um, it wasn't a road that I anticipated early on in my life. Um, I was in corporate for over 15 years and I decided to make a career change and I wanted to do something working with kids, namely, um, but I definitely wanted to do something where I felt like I was giving back. And it was I was very strategic in where I wanted to teach and the students that I wanted to connect with. So, which is why um, I was so fortunate and grateful to uh, get a job at Warner Elementary. Um, I love it, it's great, and it's everything I've ever wanted. Mm. I love that you said that because I think, and I'm gonna be real honest here, that sometimes uh, there's a perception out there that people who teach in the city are there because they've settled for a job in the city. But I think that people choose to teach in the city, that it's strategic. And, and it's a misconception sometimes to think that people are there and they don't want to be there. So people need to know that we do have awesome teachers who deliberately choose to teach in the city because that is where their heart is. I fell in love with Warner when I did my practicum. Um, and I was fortunate enough to do my practicum at Warner. I had amazing mentor teachers and I just fell in love with the staff. I fell in love with the kids. And I just knew that when I walked in the door, I said, this is where I need to be. Uh, I love that. I, I, I truly love that. So thank you for sharing because it does take big heart. Uh, and you obviously have a big heart and students are very fortunate to have you as their teacher. So what tools have you relied on instructionally? Have you learned any new technology or any new strategies that have helped you? Um, I have been using Loom. I have been using, actually just started, I, I knew about Padlet, um, but I started using it more. Um, of course, we're using Schoology. Um, in person, I haven't used it as much as I'm using it now, um, but it's, I use it every day. It's how I check for understanding. It's how I, you know, get them to, you know, tap in. Um, it's, it's definitely technology wise, um, I'm definitely being pushed to my limits as far as like what I know and definitely learning more. Yeah, I would say that you haven't reached your limits. Uh, perhaps you've taken it to the edge of your knowledge base and now you're expanding that. Uh, and you're modeling lifelong learning for, for kids. So 
I think it's humbling to let students know that you're learning right there, side by side with them. And so that's really good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. absolutely, absolutely. So you took education as a second career. What advice might you give to someone who's considering becoming a teacher? And how might you convince them the importance of considering teaching in a high needs school? If you're pursuing a career in education, you definitely have to have a passion for it. Um, there are times when it's really, really adorable. It's really, really cute. It's very fluffy. It's very airy. But there are times when it's not. And those times will make you feel like you made the wrong choice in your career. Um, but the passion for education, the passion for pushing kids forward has to be there um, because that's what keeps you going. Yeah, so not only are you going to convince someone to become a teacher, but then you're going to convince them to consider teaching in a high needs school. I, I've never taught in another school other than Warner. Um, and I'm pretty sure teaching in other schools is great. Um, uh, but teaching in a high needs school, for me, it's definitely rewarding. And, I, and it's, it's, I don't want to say it's weird, but it's definitely a different perspective because they just are so expressive with their love for you and the fact that you're there for them. They show that they appreciate it. And, and I'm sure they do it at other schools too. Um, and I, I can't compare it to anything, but I, and I feel like um, teaching at Warner just makes, it just makes it all worthwhile. I mean, there's a lot of horror stories about Warner. Warner is amazing in my book. It's one of the best schools that I know of because the kids are just so genuine. They're so real and they want, they want to do well. Yeah. And I think the stories that you refer to uh, are the narrative and it's a narrative that's sometimes written by people who have never been there. Uh, so anyone who has been to Warner, they know the true story. And so what do you do to help communicate and share what really happens? Um, it's important I showcase the positive things that happen, the positive interactions with students. I mean, there are things that happen at other schools and you know, you don't hear about them because there are other schools, but I feel like there's always a light shining on the inner city schools because they're in the inner city. Um, but I think it's important to always remember that, you know, children are children, children behave however they're gonna behave wherever they are. Um, and sometimes because it's the inner city, it's just like, oh, it's just this large pocket of kids that you know act a certain way. And that's not it at all. Sometimes it's just, you know, they're having a bad day. And it's important to understand that it's okay to have a bad day. We have bad days, but we just have to figure out a way to navigate them through that bad day and get them past it so they can get to the learning. How have you helped parents to support their children in the remote environment? I mean, we definitely have shared responsibility and shared commitment with parents. Uh, so what have you done to help parents or what advice have you given to parents to help support their students at home? Um, I feel like the best advice I can give, and sometimes it's difficult, um, is just having dedicated spaces for child learning. Um, and like I said, it's difficult. Sometimes space is limited in a home. Um, but it's also important not to just, you know, send a kid into a room and then just leave him with me for hours and then, oh, you're done. Have a conversation with him. I tell parents all the time, have them read to you, ask them questions. Let them, let them know that you're invested and interested in what they learn for that day. Don't just, you know, oh, Zoom is over and I'm gonna, you know, get on Roblox. No, have, communicate with them, talk to them. Um, just, be, just be there and communicate. That's the biggest advice that I can give to a parent during this time. There's the parents and children, teachers, we're all under a lot of stress right now. And it's just important to always keep that connection even though, you know, it's like some people aren't taking Zoom as seriously as other people, but it is serious and it's time, it's the time that students have to engage with their classmates, to engage with their teachers. So it's important that parents understand and know what's going on day in and day out. Yeah, you, you mentioned that we're all under a lot of pressure and now you have the added challenge of building relationships 
uh, not only with students, but with families, because as you're teaching, I'm sure they're not too far away. Uh, and so that's a critical piece. So you mentioned we're all under a lot of stress. Uh, in 2021, what are your hopes and aspirations for what the new year could possibly bring? Um, definitely, I want to do some self-improvement. Um, I feel like 2020 has been, for lack of a better word, a tragedy. And it's just time for us to do some self-reflection and to say, okay, how can I be my best self? How can I be a better me? How can I, you know, do more than what I've been doing? Um, and I've learned a lot about myself uh, during this year. Um, I've learned that I am, and I'm not afraid to say that I am a loner. Um, and when people were going crazy, you know, I can't, there's, there's nothing for me to do. I can't go anywhere. And I'm just like, I've been training for this my whole life. Like, this is, this is me. This is what I do. And I feel like that's my comfort zone, but I definitely want to push myself to not be so comfortable being a loner. And I think that's what 2021 is going to bring for me. My last question for you is, if you were to ask your students to describe Miss Myatt, how do you think the students would describe you? Oh gosh. Some would say I'm really mean. <laughs> um, but some would say that I'm tough. I expect a lot from them. Um, I don't let them make excuses. Um, but ultimately I would say that they know I care about them and I care about their success. So hopefully that's what they would say about me. Yeah, you say mean, but I think students appreciate the structure. They appreciate high expectations. And I definitely know that they know that you care. Ebony, thank you so much for carving out time to be with us today. I know you're extremely busy and that you spend a whole lot of time on Zoom. So adding an additional Zoom to your day is greatly appreciated. So thank you again. Oh, yeah. no, it's been great. Thank you so much. Stay right there because when we come back, we have more amazing educators who were voted by their peers to serve as Teacher of the Year in their respective schools. So we'll see you in a quick minute. I tell my son, I love you every single day. I love you. Now my dad has never said that to me. Not because he doesn't love me, but because culturally it wasn't comfortable for him. Now that he's a grandfather, he says, I love you to my son every time he sees him. My advice to all the fathers out there, forget the cultural restrictions. They grow up way too fast for you to waste even a single precious moment. Welcome back to our Teacher of the Year episode of Red Clay This Month. Our tour around the district with some of our school's Teachers of the Year continues, and our next stop is at Stanton Middle School, where we are joined by teacher Angie Falkenstein. Welcome, Angie. So Angie, if you could start off by telling us a little bit about what you do and about your road to becoming an educator. Sure, so I am a sixth grade English teacher. Um, I teach in a inclusion classroom. Um, at Stanton Middle School. I actually teach with, this is crazy, uh, my best friend since we were 14. Uh, we went to St. Mark's together. We went to the University of Delaware together. Um, so we, she got me the job at Stanton and we've been together ever since. So it's very crazy and awesome to teach with your best friend for now. This is our ninth year together, I think. Um, but I graduated from the University of Delaware with actually a bachelor's in fashion merchandising. Um, I didn't start my career right away in education. I had, I was doing something else for a bit, but my husband, um, went back and got his master's, uh, in business and I am very competitive. And I was like, well, if you're getting your bachelor's or I'm sorry, your master's, I'm going to get my master's too. So I went back. Um, I actually, my aunt was a red clay employee for a very long time. Um, she was a principal for a long time as well. Um, and of course my friend who I now teach with, 
uh, they kind of encouraged me. I was wondering like, okay, what am I going to go back and get my master's in? And, you know, what I was doing wasn't really working for me. It wasn't fulfilling. So they encouraged me with education and how rewarding it can be. Um, obviously, I knew from growing up with my aunt that it is an extremely rewarding career. So I decided to go back for education, um, graduated with my master's from Wilmington University, and um, started teaching at Stanton in 2012 and been there ever since. Love it there. Awesome. And you are now Stanton's current Teacher of the Year, so congratulations. Thank you. I almost feel that you should have your best friend sitting right here with you. I, she really should be. <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to uh, comment on is fashion merchandising and all the fashion that you wear now says Stanton. Yeah. Yes, this is like a uh, day, maybe five of a different Stanton sweatshirt this week. So we are in the hybrid model of uh, learning. What are some of the top tools or strategies that you are using to connect with and teach students during this time? Okay, um, so my teaching partner, and I, I will say her name, it's Erin Doyle. Um, she was actually Teacher of the Year, oh my gosh, maybe six or seven years ago. Um, she's amazing to work with. It is amazing to work with someone who is very caring, um, wants the students to do well. She's taught me a lot. Um, I feel as when in my first three years working with her, I learned so much from her than I would have if I was alone um, in a classroom by myself. So co-teaching is like the best thing that a, that a new teacher could do. So for us, um, we like to use our do nows to um, get to know our students and, and make sure that we build that relationship with them through this hybrid model and through the, the remote model. So we like to use, um, let's see, Padlet and um, we use Schoology, of course, um, questioning, but the things we ask are just things about them. Like, what'd you do this weekend? Um, what's your favorite holiday that's coming up? Uh, let me think. When you grow up, what do you want to be? If you went to a desert island, what, what would you take with you or who would you take with you and why? So we just kind of do all that in order to connect with our students. Get, get Because we're not in front of them, we can't get to know those little things about them in person. Yeah, and I think it's so important to ask questions when there is no wrong answer uh, so you can create the safe space allowing students to participate. So what do you love most about teaching? So what I love most about teaching would be watching them, um, watching a student succeed, especially with something that they have struggled with throughout maybe the year or, you know, the couple weeks that we've been working on something. Um, when they have that moment where they, it's, it snaps in their head that they get it, or they have that moment where, you know, they didn't do so great on something, but then you know, when we come back around to it and they, they do uh, better on it and they're, the smile on their face when they're like, see, I did it. I'm like, I knew you could. You just had to put some effort in. Um, that can be academic or it could be, you know, socially. Uh, we've had a lot of kids. We have a lot of kids at Stanton who struggle socially and emotionally. And for them to, you know, come to a teacher and or with second step, which is what we use in enrichment um, to teach social and emotional skills. When I see a kid at the beginning of the year who maybe like snaps off the chain at someone quickly, but by the end of the year, they stop and take a second and then like either walk away or say like, you know, I didn't like how you said that to me. That is great to see. That growth is great to see. Any type of growth academically or socially is Fantastic. It's important to realize that not only do you teach English language arts, but you also teach students to manage their emotions and interact in a social setting. And that's just as important. So somebody helped convince you to take the pathway toward education. What advice might you give to someone who is contemplating education as a career? Um, let me think. So this is definitely a rewarding career. Like I said, my aunt and my friend definitely inspired me. Um, it is extremely rewarding if you put your whole heart into it. Um, it's exhausting. It's long hours. Um, even after the contractual day has ended, you are taking things home and you are working and there is no line to that. Like if you want to go into teaching, it's definitely long days, but and tireless days. But when you see a kid succeed with something, that aha moment that clicks in them, that makes it all worth it. Also, we have seen 
several students come back to the building that have graduated or you see them out and they're like, oh, I'm Mrs. Falkenstein. You'll never guess what I'm doing now. Like I'm in college or this is where I work and seeing them and they're excited to still see you after all these years is another thing that makes it all worth it. Absolutely. I was in the grocery store this past weekend and one of my former students, who's now 31 years old, came up to me and said, hi, Miss Levitz. And I was like, um, hi, that was a really long time ago. Uh, nothing better than a former student remembering who you are and, and making that connection. Nothing better. Crazy when you see them. There's a couple that work at the grocery store right near me, the Acme right near me. And they're always like, oh, Mrs. Falkenstein, do you remember me? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> so now it's 2021. Uh, what commitments or goals are you hoping for this year? So I'm actually uh, two weeks from delivering our second child. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that challenge of having two children. Uh, so I will be taking, obviously, some time off of work. But I'm looking for 2020 to be gone, 2021 to be here, and hopefully, um, you know, a new start with, I can't, I don't want to say like back in the classroom and everything, because I don't know if that'll happen right away, but I just want everything to get back to normal and these kids to be in our presence so that we, they're struggling, we're struggling, we all need to be together. Um, I just want all these kids to know that this is not a reflection of them educationally, all this with, with remote learning and everything. We know what they can do in the classroom. It, they're struggling online. So hopefully 2021 brings COVID release and we are back in the buildings and with our students. Here's hoping, here's hoping. So you're having a second baby, you're balancing teaching and being a mom and the stress of a pandemic. What do you do to take care of yourself? Because it sounds like you give all of you to everything that you do. I try. Um, so I do like to um, work out. I like to stay healthy. Um, I love cooking. I, that's a, definitely a stress relief for me, cooking, baking with my daughter. Um, I love spending time with my family. Uh, my parents have a beach house. We haven't been down recently, but that is a stress relief for me. I don't care if it's winter, rain, summer, whatever. I, I love being near the water. Um, so going down there, but manicures and pedicures. <laughs> That's what I like to do. Manicures, pedicures, and cooking. I guess those are my stress relievers. That's awesome because your positive spirit is just contagious. Thank you so much. So thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. I wish you all the best with your new addition to the family. Uh, one of these days, we will absolutely have to have you and your best friend, Aaron, here so we can discuss your collaborations and how important collaboration is. So stay right where you are because when we come back, we have the ultimate, that's correct. We're joined by the Delaware Teacher of the Year, which happens, or who happens to be, from right here in Red Clay, so don't go anywhere. Every day. Millions of people are connecting. And even though we're overcoming obstacles, watching each other's backs, and banding together, we should still make an effort. We should still make an effort. To get to know each other. On a deeper level. Father. Cosplayer. Mentor. Actor. It's time we take a step forward. It's time we take a step forward. Come together. And discover how accepting our differences can make, make us stronger. Welcome back, everyone. It is truly my honor to welcome our next guest to our show. She is not only the Thomas McCain High School Teacher of the Year, she is also the Red Clay District Teacher of the Year. And wait, there's more. She is the Delaware State Teacher of the Year, something that we have not seen here in Red Clay in over a decade. She is a wife, a mother, an amazing all-around person. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Kim Stock. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey 
to becoming an educator? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say that the first time that I realized I wanted to be a teacher uh, was because of my 11th grade um, English teacher. And um, she did a couple really special things and really um, was a model for who I could be as a teacher. Um, and uh, like one of the things that she did is she brought in diverse literature. Uh, we read Maya Angelou and it was the first time that I had ever read something from Maya Angelou and um, I could just really uh, relate to it and a lot of the things and, and I realized that this is what I've been missing. I've been missing um, voices of women and, and, and uh, authors of color. And it was something that I would continue to, um, you know, ask for in future classes, actually, because of that. And uh, one day she um, had us do a, a mini lesson where we had to teach something. That was not that was not a uh, that was a unique strategy for for 1990. I have to tell you, although not so unique now, but uh, but very unique back then. And after I did my part, she said to me, you know, Kim, I think that you should be an English teacher. And um, as it turns out, uh, I just never uh, looked back. And um, and so and she was right. She was right. I should be an English teacher. And uh, and then a lot of different things happened kind of along the way that just really just kept encouraging me uh, to continue uh, to be a teacher. And that's when I uh, was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And um, they actually offered scholarships for prospective uh, teachers of color. And that was really, that was honestly one of the ways uh, and probably the main way that I was actually able to remain in college uh, because it's something that I had to pay for my own college. And uh, without those scholarships, um, I would not have been able to do that, to be honest. Um, so just the encouragement of that. Um, I was lucky enough to kind of um, to get uh, awarded uh, with a professor, um, an undergraduate, uh, minority undergraduate uh, research grant. And so I started uh, to learn what it meant to research in the field of, of education. And uh, my focus was on, on students of color uh, back in uh, 1992, 1993. Um, I have been um, in and out of the classroom, but always connected to education and in every single one of my jobs, uh, whether that be working in higher education or working in nonprofit as an education administrator uh, for the nonprofit. Uh, but I have to tell you that um, I really think back to when I was an eighth grade teacher in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was an English teacher and um, I don't, just something happened. I, I was um, having them do, I don't remember exactly the project, but it was some kind of writing project. And um, I just remember thinking that there was a, a good number of students who were not engaged, who were not, who were not, um, they, they weren't gonna pass because um, it was, uh, they, they haven't, they weren't doing any work yet. And I said to myself, you know, if I can't get them to do the job, if I can't get them, uh, to turn something in, then they really haven't learned anything. And if they fail, really that's kind of my failure. And uh, so I started to put the effort forth and um, in talking to the families and I invited, and I mean, when I say invited, it wasn't really an invitation, but I, I invited the students who were not working um, and who weren't engaging to stay with me after school uh, to work on their projects. And in actuality, for many of them, that worked because it, it provided us to have that one-on-one -on -one time. I was able to make that connection with the students. And as well, they could see that I was serious. I was not going to uh, just let them uh, skate by. I wasn't going to let them fail. And uh, I've taken that lesson with me, to be honest, um, you know, in all of my teaching jobs. And, uh, from here on out. And uh, I have to say that um, in, in every classroom, every student teaches you a new lesson about how to be a better teacher. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I mean, this year obviously has been really, really hard for everybody. It's been probably the, the most difficult year um, for me as, as a teacher, as an educator. Um, but I also know that for our students and for our families, it has also been really, really hard. And, you know, we just have to, um, we have to trade in some of our, I don't want to say expectations, but we really have to, um, you know, treat this year with a lot more kindness, um, give ourselves, give, give each other a little bit more grace. And, you know, it's important to every day to think about three things that went well. We could focus always on the things that don't go well. Um, and this year, there's a lot of them, I have to say. Uh, but uh, but just trying to also try to keep that, that kernel 
of, of what it is that we do because we still are reaching our students. It's just, it just looks a lot different this year. I love everything about what you just said. First of all, as a teacher, you never realize who you're inspiring. And I am hopeful that your English teacher knows that she was your inspiration. Your focus on equity ahead of your time, providing people, students, opportunities they might not otherwise have so that they can be as successful as you are today. And then your focus on learning. Just because students weren't turning things in, you knew better that they did not have the capacity. That if you couldn't get them to show you what they knew, that you own that as well. And I think that's incredible because it's so easy to say that they're not doing anything and that's on them and that that's just not good enough. And so I love everything about what you just said. So thank you very much. So you're the state teacher of the year and what we just talked about lends itself to your platform. So talk about your experience thus far as the state teacher of the year and what do you hope to achieve this year? Well, I have to say that that's been a huge bright spot uh, for myself, but the most important thing um, as the state teacher of the year is, is that I do have people who actually um, now listen and actually care about uh, what I have to say. And so I'm really using that to really shine a light on, um, you know, first of all, um, the, the issue of how we can create schools that are more culturally proficient. And I think a lot of people might think, well, I don't have time for that. It, uh, it's just too stressful of a year. But the reality is, is that for our students of color, for our educators of color, this is a reality that they have lived their entire life. And as somebody who has who has lived that reality and who has, you know, very few opportunities have I seen or learned about somebody who who looks like me. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I can definitely relate to. And I can tell you that honestly, when you bring in lessons that are relevant to your students, they open up. Um, it is, it's one of those things that when they see themselves and they say, this is the first time that I can see myself or I can really see my family here. It's such a positive thing. It's a, it's a win, win for everybody. Um, and so it, it is about, you know, I think that um, for, I love the fact that we have um, a district uh, person who is, you know, and Dr. Bond, who is helping us uh, with this uh, task. And then I also love that every school has uh, a district committee. Um, I'm really proud of the things that we've been able to do at McCain. And uh, it's, it's exciting. We're looking forward to the next step of involving uh, more of our students and as well as our families. And it's definitely something that as a teacher of the year that um, as I speak to people, whether that be um, people who are making laws or um, other educators who are making, you know, large decisions. It's definitely one of the things that I, I stress and that I talk about because every school district can do it. And I think that red clay is, is a really good model. And, and we're not done. We have a, we have a long ways to go. But um, I think that we have really made a lot of uh, some, some really positive changes in the last couple of years. And I can see that in the district and I can definitely see that at my school too. Um, the other part of my platform is um, equity for, of, of opportunities for our English learners. I think that um, every educator in Delaware understands that uh, there's that our English learners have maybe one of the highest needs in a school and unfortunately have um, some of the fewest numbers of certified people who can really help them. And so it's been, it's been a wonderful thing to be able to um, sit in and put some input on the government, governor's advisory uh, for English learners, as well as to meet with uh, other advocates and other lawmakers. Um, on Monday, uh, my uh, principal, uh, Brian Maddox and I, we were actually invited to uh, give a presentation about English learner services and their needs, especially in relationship to the uh, opportunity grants. Um, that the governor has has proposed um, and, and we were able to um, talk to the um, legislative house education committees so exciting uh, to be able to you know, give people who have the power to really make changes for us um, in, in the district in the state um, and, and and in our schools um, and of course uh, we highly encourage them uh, to to pass the uh, opportunity grant um, but also um, another thing that I have really advocated for is we have got to get more teachers trained in English learner strategies and we have got to get more in, um, teachers certified. There's a number of ways that we can do that, especially if we look at our neighboring states. 
Um, you know, for example, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, these are states that require uh, teachers as they're get, becoming certified for that state to take at least one class in second language acquisition, English learner methods, or whatever it is that you, or, or, you know, or, or whatever the title is, um, but that they're required to take that. And another thing that we could also do is we can take advantage of our critical needs scholarship, which is what I use to become certified. And then because I realized that I needed to learn more, that's why I went ahead um, and got my second master's at the University of Delaware in TESOL. And, uh, but the reality is, is that if we can make that critical needs scholarship something that the teacher could have up front, meaning so that if the teacher wouldn't have to pay out of his or her own pocket to take these classes to become certified, what an incentive that would be. Because not only would you learn the skills necessary uh, to help your students, uh, but it would also be something that you wouldn't be having to pay out of your own pocket. I think that would really um, be a, a huge incentive for our teachers. And, then, and also, um, we need to learn more methods and have more training in SIA as well as so that we can learn how to uh, how to help our how for everybody to help our English learner students, uh, whether you're a math teacher or a health teacher or a driver's ed teacher, it doesn't matter, or an English learner teacher, um, that we can really work together. But things are not gonna get better for our students unless we have more teachers and more educators who know how to help them and can continue to help lead our way. Well, I am confident that in your leadership role right now that you will influence and impact outcomes for kids and that you will lead up, that the governor and that the secretary of education, that they're all listening and I know it's gonna make a difference. So can you talk about some of these strategies that you mentioned and how you're applying them in the current hybrid model? Yes, definitely. That is something that has been um, really a challenge, um, but also for, for, for all of us who are continuing to learn, it's also an exciting time to learn new strategies. And one of the things that I've been doing is I always check in with my students. We always start class um, in that way. Uh, we have a model of restorative practice uh, at our school uh, with Dr. Haas. And, um, and, and it's something that every good teacher does anyways. Uh, but you can do things like have a, have a Jamboard check-in. I don't know why, but students really love Jamboard. They love to like, uh, I think it's because they like to move other people's pieces around. I, that's what I think. Um, but um, I also will just give them a Google form uh, to check in. I always ask them, how are you doing? How can I help you? Um, you know, how are you feeling today? And then I always ask them, you know, some kind of a question to get to know them because it ha that has been really one of the challenges to kind of build that um, community and that relationship that you normally have with students when you're face to face. And it's definitely something that I will never take, it, <laughs> take for granted uh, ever, ever again. I don't think we ever will. Um, but I discovered another site that my students um, have really loved, and it's called wordwall.net. And you can use that to teach vocabulary, which of course is important for all of our students, but especially our English learner students. And it's really neat because it takes, uh, it doesn't take that long for you to input some information in there. But um, my students have been playing this Pac-Man type game in order to, uh, to review their vocabulary and, and to learn that vocabulary. And it's wonderful because of course, it gives them a little bit of competition because there's a leaderboard. And of course, since I'm so terrible at, uh, at video games, um, I'm always last. It's OK. That's fine. Um, I, it doesn't bother me at all because they love they love seeing if they can beat each other and they're learning and they can still learn at their home, um, you know, by using their Chromebooks and everything, even though we're not in the same room. There's also other things on there, like uh, uh, something that I found um, to also, you know, to get conversation going with your students. It says they can, um, you can send them a link to a conversation wheel and they can spin it and then it goes to like a question and then they have to answer it. So it gets them to talk, which is really, really been a challenge uh, for all of our students um, to, you know, they feel, they don't they don't feel as comfortable talking uh, for some reason um, in the uh, online setting. Um, I've also um, made the effort to drop off old fashioned books to my students, um, whether it was dropping off books and the summer assignment to my AP Lit students this summer or just recently um, I made a run um, to drop off books because I tell them, you know, we're really going to appreciate just being able to read a book. 
together. And uh, you don't have to look at your screen and you can, you know, curl up in your favorite place and it can still be something you can still engage with literature and with reading. And so just something like that. Now I'm lucky, I don't have a ton of students, uh, but uh, so I'm lucky that I, that I have the, uh, that, I, that I can do that. Um, but I also just love things like um, students can collaborate and teachers can collaborate. Uh, we actually had um, the Odyssey Charter uh, District uh, Teacher of the Year. She had her student um, re uh, read a book about voting rights uh, in Spanish. And then she sent it to us or she sent it to me. And then I created a lesson where students could, uh, you know, listen to the book, watch the book. It was a video on YouTube. And then they could respond, give these, give that student um, who is not a native Spanish speaker some feedback with her Spanish and the presentation of the book. And then we could take that a little bit further and then they could learn more about the history of voting rights and kind of learning surprisingly when some people were actually able to, to be able to vote um, in, in different groups. And, um, and then they were able to relate that then to what is voting, what are the, what is voting equality or inequality look like in their home country. And so um, I shared this lesson um, with uh, my other two English learner teachers and it's been really fun to just read and collaborate uh, in that manner. And so students can learn from each other too. And then I just recently um, just did, uh, I had one of my classes do a debate using Flipgrid. Uh, because I was really worried about the, the quality of people being able to hear each other uh, with the internet issues and with the Chromebook issues. And so I thought, you know what? I can send them the link. They can record themselves using their phone, their cell phones, which since I teach high school, most of them have cell phones. Um, and they can get a better quality of both a video um, as well as them speaking and giving those parts. It has taken longer uh, than normal. And I think that's that's just the theme this week, this year, it, everything takes longer. Uh, but so I have been able to use some of that, uh, some, of, some of the technology to my advantage. And, and to be honest, um, I would really like after the pandemic to find a way to keep that chat box with us because I love it. And I think the students have really benefited uh, from being able to send you a private message and uh, for you to be able to say, hey, everybody put a, a one, two, three, or four, how you're feeling today, or something like that in the chat box. And so those types of things, I hope that we can keep with us and that we can also just uh, learn how to keep everybody engaged. So what advice might you give to a young person? Uh, teaching sometimes gets a bad rap and it's really a rewarding prof profession. It's hard work, but it's super rewarding. So what advice might you give to a young person who's considering what they want to address or solve, like what problem they want to solve as they get older and might want to consider teaching. How would you convince someone that it's a noble profession and convince them of all the benefits? Well, I can tell you that as uh, somebody who works at McCain, I always encourage my students to become teachers. Um, I am hoping that that is definitely the case um, because we need teachers it's like, like the students that we have. They are a diverse group of people. A lot of them are bilingual. Some of them speak more than one language. These are skills that we really need. And I would, and I tell my students, you know, despite the challenges of this year, hopefully it's not always going to be like this. Hopefully 2021 is really gonna help us to, to get back to a little bit more normalcy, whatever that means. And, um, and, that, and, and they should absolutely uh, consider being a teacher because there is, you'll never be bored. I think that's one of the most important things uh, to know about teaching other jobs. You might feel a little bit bored. You may not feel challenged. You never feel that way as a teacher. And, uh, and the other thing is that uh, every day you're going to laugh. Uh, the best thing is to laugh with your students. The best thing is to laugh with your colleagues. And it is a hard job, but there is joy every single day. And even in this pandemic, um, we still have been able to find, you know, smaller pieces of joy, but pieces of joy still uh, in being able to, to be a teacher and, and what it is. And then if you, you know, if you're somebody who it's important for you to feel valued and fulfilled and, and who doesn't feel that way, I really feel like teaching is that profession that can give people, can give young people um, that, that feeling every day. And sometimes you have to search for it, but it is there. Absolutely, thank you. So how would your students describe you? Well, I, I actually did just recently ask them this, not because of this, but because I was trying to figure out how I could best help them. And I asked them, um, in asking them, what do I need to do to change? 
um, you know, what they said to me is they said, well, you explain things well. So I would say that that's one of the things that they would say about me is that um, to a student that I explain things well, that's important. I'm teaching uh, English learners, I'm teaching a uh, regular English um, ELA students. Um, I think they would also describe me as someone who's kind uh, because I think above all else, um, I really try to make it something that above all else, I'm going to be kind um, to them and show them that kindness because that's something I would like in return. And, and I think they would also say that I really am their biggest cheerleader. Um, one of the best things about having this title is I've been able to shine a light on them, to be honest. And, uh, you know, at a school like McCain, we don't always have wins. And so if it's something that I can provide that for the people who work so hard there and, and, and Rob knows how hard people work there and how and how um, and how, you know, wonderful our students are. It's a pleasure. It's truly a pleasure and an honor to do that. And because, um, to be honest, they are they really are winners. So um, I am their biggest cheerleader for sure. Yeah. And some days uh, you're right. They're harder than others. I actually keep a folder of nice words about me. So anytime that somebody sends me something positive, uh, some days I just pull out that folder and I remind myself that, yeah, what I'm doing does matter uh, and it makes a difference because, again, you never know who you're inspiring. Exactly. I do the same thing because you got to hold on to those moments. <laughs> so it sounds like, and I know that you work incredibly hard all day, every day. So what do you do to carve out time for you? Yeah, that's definitely be, been a little bit harder this year, but something I definitely still do. Um, I, I pray, honestly, every day, and that just helps to ground me um, with my with my focus and, and really, honestly, making things not necessarily about me, um, but about necessarily how I can be how I can be used um, to, you know, help others. Um, I read, um, you know, it's been fun, actually, since we've been spending so much time um, to uh, to actually uh, to read books, uh, so that's been that's been fun too. Um, and uh, it sounds kind of silly, but since I had two teenage daughters, they they got me onto TikTok, and I have made a couple, but I'm not very good at it. But I have honestly learned a lot. I know that sounds silly. I've learned a lot about cooking. I've learned a lot about animals. I've learned a lot about different cultures. And uh, so I love it. I love it. Uh, so that's something I love to do. Um, and of course, uh, I am a, a wife and a mother. So I do, you know, enjoy spending time with my family. And as my uh, girls are getting older, uh, that's something that can be a little bit more challenging. But so that's been one of the blessings uh, of the pandemic. And again, you know, I just try to remain uh, grateful for the opportunities that I have, especially for this year. I try to remain grateful for the wins um, you know, with my students um, and my wins uh, that, that I have uh, throughout the day. Um, and, uh, and really, it's just one of those things where um, it just it can it just helps to keep me going, to be honest. Gratitude is definitely a strategy during these difficult times. Well, Kim, it has been my honor and privilege to spend this time with you. And I'm so excited to see the impact that you're going to have over the course of this school year as Teacher of the Year at McCain, as Red Clay Teacher of the Year, and as the Delaware State Teacher of the Year. A well-deserved honor. Uh, so thank you for what you do. And again, I look forward to the greatness that is going to happen this year. Well, thank you for your support. And, uh, and, and honestly, I just could not have done it without, without my colleagues and without my students and, and the support from the district. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. A big shout out to teachers everywhere. Teachers who are doing such amazing things uh, during these amazing times. You make each day feel unique and each student feel special. And I thank you all. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. As always, I like to leave you with a quote. And today's quote comes to us from Benjamin Franklin, who said, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I will learn. Have a great day, be well, and we'll see you next time.